Welcome to Black History Matters 2022, presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum, also known as NAHOF, located in Peterborough, New York. Black History Matters is an educational series that seeks to highlight historical events in the Black American experience. This series consists of 28 videos that NAHOF will release daily through the month of February 2022. Videos are viewable on NAHOF's website. The mission of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is to honor anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strive to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. This program was funded in part by Humanities New York, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Deirdre Sennett. A native of Utica, New York, and a lifelong civil rights activist, she has dedicated her life to fighting institutionalized racism. Sennett has spoken about the history of the Underground Railroad and abolition, and was a historical consultant for the 2020-2021 National Park Services Survey of Oneida County, New York's Underground Railroad sites, headed by historian Judith Wellman and commissioned by the Fort Stanwix National Monument. The Third Mrs. Galway is Sonnet's first novel. The book has received many accolades such as the Writers' Lounge 2021 Bookshelf Award and the Women's National Book Association 2021 Great Group Reads. I'd like to now invite Deirdre to begin her presentation. Oh, thank you so much and welcome to everybody. Uh, I wanna thank the National Abolition Hall of Fame and the organizer of this series, Victoria Basuto. I'm so proud of my historical novel, The Third Mrs. Galway. It's gotten support from local and New York State historians in part because I worked so hard to make it accurate. The action starts in Utica, New York in 1835 when a young woman, recently married to a leading member of the Colonization Society, sees something strange in her backyard. And she goes to investigate and she finds two people who are running from enslavement. That puts her right at the center, all of a sudden, of the biggest moral question of the era. Like what should she do? Should she turn them in? Should she do nothing? Should she help them? It's her decision and it's not easy. And we all would like to think that we would be the ones who help people, but it's usually not that simple. There's four historical events that make up the underpinnings of the novel. Three of them are represented on this map. Those three occurred within a three year period between 1833 and 1836. And it really put central New York firmly in people's minds as a place that was for abolition and with a very strong anti-abolition current running through it, as well as being a place for Underground Railroad activities. The fourth incident occurred in 1851 and in Pennsylvania. So I'm going to go through each one of these. And during my book tour, I tended to go through these events and give them a general outline. But because this is for Black History Month, I wanna emphasize what I know about the actions of African-Americans, both enslaved and free. By the way, I'll be talking generally about people and events that have been covered in other National Abolition Hall of Fame talks. So I encourage you to go check out their web, their uh, YouTube channel. They've got some really great stuff on there. From December 31st, 1833, well into January, 1834, there was a debate between Reverend Joshua Danforth, the main traveling agent for the American Colonization Society, and a fiery abolitionist named Reverend Beriah Green. Danforth didn't come to Utica expecting a debate. His usual experience was that he gave a lecture on the importance of ending slavery by sending free African-Americans to Liberia, which is on the west coast of Africa. He would read a resolution supporting the scheme, and after he made his argument, the resolution would be voted on. But in Utica, there was a tiny but growing cadre of abolitionists. And the event dragged on for two weeks. And after it was over, there was an anti-abolition riot. 
Now, if you've already read my book, and if you're going to read the book, you'll hear about a scarecrow that has these burn marks that Alvin Stewart, the lawyer, keeps up in the corner of his office. Well, this event is how that scarecrow got its burn marks. For us, one of the most important things about the event is revealed in this letter. It corroborates descriptions in the newspapers that say that the audience was mixed, both black and white and male and female. The article of the Liberator starts by saying that it's a letter from a colored friend in Utica. This person describes that the debate is going on and that people are already planning to form an anti-slavery society there. These two letters both outline a controversy about the way the debates ended. A vote was taken and the colonization proposal was approved. Now, newspapers tell us that the proposal was passed and that some of the black participants voted for the measure. In the letter from the Emancipator, the writer says, quote, there was a colonization trick played off on three of our most ignorant colored men. The writer describes one of the men who voted as lately made his escape from the South. He went on to write three, that the three were considered by Danforth to be proper subjects in the eyes of, of the colonizations, colonizationists to legislate for their half a million free brethren. But these same individuals refused to leave the country themselves but it is enough that they called on Mr. Danforth and one voted for the re resolution. Now, what this shows is that there were freedom seekers in Utica in 1833, 1834, and that they were getting help from the black community because how else would this writer know these, this person's status? So in 1833, 1834, Utica is already a point on the Underground Railroad. The second letter, from the Utica Observer, disputes the accusation of a ruse in the first. He says, there was not a trick played off on those who voted in favor of the resolutions, which were passed at the close of the colonization debate. The people of color who voted on that occasion, it is believed voted understandingly and, hoped that, and it is hoped that none of them will see cause to regret their course, a colored man who voted. Okay, so the debate ends. And the next day, there is an anti-abolition riot. And two, two effigies are burned on the night of January 15th, 1834. And they are hanging on this cart that is rolled up and down Genesee Street. No police come, no one stops them. It just is an organized protest against abolition. And the two people who were represented by those scarecrows were Alvin Stewart and Reverend Beriah Green. The following year in 1835, they go on to organize the founding meeting of the New York Anti-Slavery Society in Utica. Stewart at that time was president of the Utica Anti-Slavery Society, which hadn't existed the year before. And Green is running the Oneida Institute of Manual Labor School in Whitesboro, which allows black and white students to attend together and receive the same degrees. Ultimately, there were a number of black abolitionists who graduated from his school. And uh, some of them are well known, like Henry Highland Garnett, uh, Alexander Crummel, and Jermaine Logan. These men weren't at the October 21st and 22nd, 1835 founding meeting of the New York Anti-Slavery Society, but important African-American abolitionist David Ruggles was. He lived in New York City and he had been part of, he'd been under attack in 1834 by the riots that uh, targeted his house and targeted other abolitionists' house and ranged up and down they burned his bookstore. They, they trashed his bookstore, let's say. So after the Utica meeting, he goes back to New York City and he helps found the New York City Committee of Vigilance, which helps free freedom seekers and other African-Americans who have been accused of being runaway slaves. And there is a group in New York City called the Kidnapping Club. And they have a judge, they have uh, marshals, and they 
when they're low on money, no doubt, they grab somebody and bring them to the judge in a rubber stamp and that person is sold down south. The convention in 1835 itself was under attack for the moment that it was announced. In August, articles and meetings and votes on the Common Council, speeches, so many speeches, denounced the meeting as a threat to the peace of the nation, a disgrace to Utica, and a potential gathering of wild-eyed fanatics. It got underway in Utica at the Bleecker Street Church, but before an hour had passed, it was disrupted by a committee of 25 gentlemen of property and standing and a mob of Uticans who got into physical confrontations with the attendees. As the participants of the conference fled, they were pelted with eggs and mud and stones. During the fracas, Garrett Smith got up and told everybody to come to Peterborough the following day to complete their business. And they did. Hundreds of people went. I have a list of about 500 participants. And they went to the same building that houses the National Abolition Hall of Fame right now. There's a museum there. It's worth going and taking a look at. Anyway, I got so fascinated by this anti-abolition organizing and riot that I started researching it in 2007. By 2015, I was beginning to work on the novel and knew that the whole struggle in Utica had to be represented. I gave abolitionism its own narrative arc in the novel and nothing worked better for doing that than this incident. So there was an attendance, as I said, taken in Peterborough and a good number of men of color were in the pews besides David Ruggles. Smith had opened the school to educate Blacks on their own on May 1st, 1834. Garrett Smith hoped that the students there would go on to educate other African Americans in both the United States and in Africa. It could be said that the students only attended the second day of the disrupted anti-slavery society meeting which occurred in Peterborough after Smith's invitation. The school was closed in 1836. Okay, if you take a look, there is this list uh, on the other side where I've marked who was a student in this little section of the list. So you can imagine that what happened was people were sitting and organizers passed down pieces of paper and people signed their names. And that's how you get all of these people who were students working, sitting next to each other, boom, boom, boom. Uh, also, uh, Federal Dana, who worked for Garrett Smith is there, and C. Grant, who apparently was a teacher. Now, James Gloucester and Elimus P. Rogers both went on to be ministers. They accomplished much and even had Fredericks Douglas speaking at their churches. Rogers, unfortunately, ended up dying of malaria in Liberia. He went there to be part of the, the, the education of people who had moved from the United States to, to Liberia voluntarily. And Henry Highland Garnett, who had been at school with Bry Green, did his eulogy. And also, if you've read the book, you'll see that name, Elimus. I used Elimus P. Rogers' first name as one of the characters as a kind of a tribute to him. Uh, there were also other African-Americans who attended the meeting in Utica and Peterborough. They were Amos B. Beeman, who is the son of two abolitionists who became a pastor and a missionary. Amos No Freeman, who became a minister and he worked in New York, New Jersey, Maine, and Brooklyn. He helped a young woman named Anna Marie Weems escape to Canada, and during parts of her escape, she was disguised as a boy. James W. Higgins came to the event with David Ruggles, and he was a grocer and the co-founder of the New York City Committee of Vigilance, and he was active in the Day Street Church in New York City. Richard Jackson lived in Utica, and he ran a band in a dancing school, apparently quite a guy. Uh, and I've seen him in other little things in the newspapers there. Thomas James was another Utican who was named in the document announcing the founding meeting of the New York Anti-Savory Society. This is the thing that went out in August. 
And that got everybody so upset, this list of people who were supporting it. So here's Thomas James, an early abolitionist in town. And then there's Reverend William Yates, who was a freedom seeker, who wrote a book titled Slavery and the Colored People of Delaware. At this time, he was working with abolitionists in Troy, New York. Okay, so the next historical incident that I mirrored in the book, this one is also very interesting. In the spring of 1836, two young men from Shenandoah County, Virginia, were told by their mistress that she was ill and might soon die. She was worried that as they enslaved people, as if she died, they would be sold by her heirs. Now they live in the town of Woodstock, right on the main highway that cuts through the Shenandoah Valley. And there are coffles of enslaved people who are being bought from farms all the way up through Virginia and who are walking all the way to the Mississippi to take boats down to New Orleans to be sold into the deep South. So there is a letter describing one of these coffles that's walking down the street in this town where these two young men lived. And the guy counts the number of people there. And he said there was 125 people chained together, plus women and children walking. So there's a very visceral understanding of what it means to be sold down the river in this town. And, and, and Mrs. Geyer, who had the use of these people plus other enslaved people for her lifetime after her husband died, she gave Harry Bird and George money and told them to seek their freedom in the North. They left Woodstock and went on a long journey down the Shenandoah Valley, ended up in Philadelphia where they met their first abolitionist. They had heard that there were white people who would help people running from enslavement, but they didn't believe that such that such people really existed. So from Philadelphia, they traveled to New York City. And by September, they've arrived in Utica, New York, and there they stay. It's quite likely that they were able to blend in with the black population of about 230 people in Utica. Many of those people lived in rooming houses on Post Street, which is a tiny one block street. Right now it's behind the new bus station. It is very short and very packed. This was the center of the black community, but they were spread all over Utica. If you look here, you'll see that there's other places where there's black, black people living, but there's a lot centered in on Post Street. Now, black abolitionists lived there, like James Fountain, who was a shoemaker and a pastor, and Joseph C. Panko, a whitewasher who worked for both commercial establishments and on local city contracts. And David Wyckoff, a cook on a packet boat in the Erie Canal. Jesse Jackson, another cook on a packet boat. By the way, the Erie Canal provided a lot of employment for African-American people. And again, Richard Jackson, the musician. And they all lived there with their families. And there were some white abolitionists who also lived nearby Post Street. Lewis Lawrence was a prosperous builder. And Hen Henry Newland, the owner of a shoe store. John Bailey was a butcher and the owner of a restaurant called the City Exchange. So Harry, Bird, and George probably found a place to stay on Post Street. But on December 28th, on a very cold night, both, this is 1836, Harry and George were arrested at the demand of Christian Miller, who was the jailer of Shenandoah County. Now he, this is months after they left, how long it was before it was known by the heirs of Mrs. Geyer that these two guys were gone, it's hard to tell. And how Miller came to discover their location in Utica, I mean, little Utica out of all the whole world, is still not yet known. But he traveled all the way upstate to bring these two men back to Virginia and to collect the reward. So the following morning, they're brought to Judge Chester Hayden's office. This building looks a lot better right now than it does in this photo. It's been fixed up. It's being called the Judge Chester Hayden uh, building. It still exists. It's on Lower Genesee Street. 
uh, down near where Utica Coffee is. So abolitionist Spencer Kellogg, whose store right, is right there in the center of this block, um, he's, it, it's a different building, but anyway, he it has a grocery store and he's standing outside and Lewis Lawrence alerts him that there's two men who they just saw being driven by in an open cart, that they are being held and brought before Judge Chester Hayden and that both men suspect that they are under arrest for being runaways. Uh, and so they, they go and find out what's going on. And then they get abolitionist lawyer, Alvin Stewart. They alert him and he goes to Hayden's office to fight for Harry and George. Now the black community, some people might've known Harry and, Harry and George. And they are in general on alert for incidents like this doing research for a survey of Oneida County about the Underground Railroad, I found at least three incidents, or we, there's another one too, that people found out that someone, they thought someone was being held against their will, that they had been arrested as being a runaway slave, or they were enslaved and didn't know that they were in free territory, or they were under arrest for reasons that the police wouldn't explain. They were ready and they would run to the area where the person was being held. So they did that in this instance and they showed up in the street outside and inside the building and it was a very tense scene. And at six o'clock that evening, the fighting began. Now I used this incident and that's why I'm not gonna tell you the outcome. But let me just say that in 1836, there were other attempted rescues of people accused of running away from enslavement. For example, in New York City in August of 1836, just when Harry and, and George might have been passing through that place, there was one with, from a person who was allegedly a slave, an enslaved person who left Maryland and had been working in New York. And he was under arrest, and it was the kidnapping club. And he denied being. Uh, a, being uh, Gosley, I think was the name that the that the enslaver um, gave this man, but he denied they he denied being there. And this incident ended badly, where he was sent back or sent to Maryland, um, probably to be sold. But there were other ones that happened that ended in liberation. There's a number right in this period. So you're going to have to buy the book or look at the book in the library to find out what happens with my characters. But it was something that was happening frequently in, 18, in the 1830s. Okay. The last incident that I used for the book happened not in Utica and not in the 1830s. It was the Christiana Uprising from September 11th, 1851. And that was after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850. And that was a draconian law. It imposed a $1,000 fine on, a, on an officer if they did not arrest a freedom seeker. And the same fine plus six months imprisonment for anyone aiding a fugitive from service. Now, a lot of us would find $1,000 to be a big fee. But back then, it was like gigantic. You, it would bankrupt you. You would be trying to pay it back for the rest of your life. So when the, the, the town of Christiana is quite close to the Maryland border. So you have a free state in Pennsylvania and Maryland, which is a slave state. So people were kind of going past a lot. So when Maryland enslaver Edward Gorsuch shows up at the house of African-American and freedom seeker, former enslaved person, William Parker, demanding that the four people who escaped from enslavement be turned over to him, there was a gunfire exchange and Gorsuch died. So I wanted to show in my book, the militancy of the African-American people to fight for their freedom. This uprising is just one of many acts taken by enslaved people to grasp their freedom. And I think in general, it's not well known outside of the uh, people who study the Underground Railroad and abolition but it's part of the terrible history of enslavement and the struggle to end the system that culminated in the Civil War. 
So the story of the encounter with the long-faced man in my book was based on Christiana, even though it was 16 years before the event. Now, I hope I haven't given away any big secrets, though they exist in the book. And I hope that the third Mrs. Galway is a contribution to the struggle against racism in all its forms and a ripping yarn. Now, people tell me that they couldn't put it down after they picked it up. So I'm warning you right, in, right up front. It's hard to put down. If you want to find out more about the book, please visit www.thirdmrsgalway.com. And I just want to thank the National Abolition Hall of Fame for all their support. Thank you, Deirdre, for your contribution of this presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, Nehoff has provided a reference list of sources to learn more about it. This reference list is located in the video description box. Please help us by completing a brief survey available at the link on your screen and also in the video description box. Feedback will help Nehoff receive funding and help plan future projects. Additionally, please contact Nehoff with any questions and if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Once again, thank you Deirdre for donating your time and contributing to this program. And thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey, Black History Matters. We hope to see you at our next presentation.